I really appreciate the turnout tonight and uh, that kind welcome, and I really would like to uh, thank all the people who've participated to make this evening possible. Uh, since Jim Green's sudden death in February 2012, SFU's uh, Van City Office of Community Engagement has sponsored these annual lectures to remind us both of Jim's legacy and his vision for the city. In 2013, Ken Leoche explored Jim's philosophy of community development, and Ken's here again tonight. Uh, and uh, Bob Williams, who I think is also here, welcome Bob, uh, uh, explored his years, uh, lessons, drew lessons from his years of work with Jim. But uh, this year, Am and I decided to try to do something a little bit different. And uh, rather than eulogize Jim, which is, is easy to do and something that I uh, find very compelling, I decided to do two things. First, to evaluate how Jim's theories of society and community development had worked out in real life for the people in the affordable housing he helped create. And second, to invite a panel of activists and experts to suggest what lessons we can draw to build on Jim's achievements for the future. So tonight is intended to be forward-looking, uh, not just retrospective, and action-oriented, not just reflective. For reasons that will become obvious, it's critical that we hear the voices of those who worked with Jim to create the housing they now call home. And I want to pause here to thank uh, David Beers, publisher of the TAI, and I think I just glimpsed David over there somewhere. Uh, Thanks to his assistance, F SFU and the TAI were able to strike a partnership arrangement to do an investigative series alongside tonight's forum to bring those voices to us. And I want to acknowledge uh, TAI housing reporter David Ball, who's also here, who interviewed the downtown east side residents of Jim's projects and agreed to allow us to use excerpts from those interviews for tonight's forum. Uh, in an interview with a reporter in the 1980s, Jim said that the only thing worse than injustice was not acting on it knowing that something was wrong and not acting on it. That philosophy, I think, was at the heart of his years as director of the Downtown Eastside Residents Association, a job he took on at the request of Bruce Erickson, Libby Davies, and Gene Swanson in about 1980. The fundamental injustice of the Downtown East Side then, as it is today, was the shortage of affordable and social housing. Jim set out to tackle this injustice, and in the process, I think he achieved a dramatic change in his community. Let's quickly recall Jim's built legacy that remains all around us, starting with the Four Sisters Co-op. And, and David has kindly uh, put together slides, and you'll see pictures of these housing projects behind me as I, as I speak. Uh, the uh, Four Sisters uh, Co-op was named for Vancouver's Four Sister Cities. It incorporated three old factory and warehouse buildings uh, not too far from here where Gastown meets the downtown east side. Today, that community includes 200 mixed income members, many families with children, speaking at least six languages, and living in 153 units. The last of Jim's DERA projects was Solheim Place on Union Street, which was completed in 1993 with 84 units. And the others that came both before and after Solheim Place included the DERA Co-op on Alexandra Street, Tellier Tower on Hastings, Pandera on Pender, Lori Krill on Cordova Street, Bruce Erickson Place at Maine and Hastings, and finally Woodward's with 200 affordable units. Altogether, there are more than 750 affordable and social housings in the downtown east side that Jim had a direct hand in developing over a 20 year period from his time at Dira to the completion of Woodward's when he was on city council. And during that time, he moved from executive director at Dira to a position heading the community development unit in Glenn Clark's NDP administration to his election as a city councilor in 2002. When we recall the massive political and economic investment necessary for the province to complete 1,400 units uh, of social housing in Vancouver between, say, 2002 when Gordon Campbell made the commitment with, no, it was 2005 or six that they made this commitment uh, to the Sam Sullivan administration to now when we're just completing the last one, we can see the size of Jim's achievement. And I was asking Celine Mobilis earlier how big it is. It's very hard to put into numbers, but I, th I believe that the city's contribution in land alone exceeded $300 million for those 1,400 units. I think the total cost of the program is somewhere in the, in the region of a billion dollars. I'd be happy to be told it was cheaper, but it's very, very large numbers. And as we know, uh, they've barely shifted the dial, unfortunately, on homelessness and housing crisis in the city. This. Uh, number of 750, which uh, some of us have debated and batted back and forth, does not take into account many other projects in which Jim played a role, including assisting in the foundation of the Portland Hotel Society. But lots of us hate injustice. Not many can point to achievements that are this large in terms of fighting injustice, especially on the housing front. 
And so why was he successful? Why was Jim successful? And I think we have to acknowledge that the DERA projects were built in a time when both provincial and federal governments remained committed to affordable housing, contributing both capital and operating funds. And today, both levels of government are basically out of the game completely, and we see the province now trying to sell the land on which affordable housing stands to the people who are living in their homes on it. Nor should we think for a minute that Jim worked alone, and I don't make that claim. Uh, he had support and involvement from countless others in the community, in the community, at the city, and in the development community, and among architects and designers and so forth. So he was very much a collaborative person, and, and I would never propose that he could have done all this by himself. But someone had to begin the work. It required a successful strategy, and I think that's where Jim excelled. I believe Jim's secret lay in his political philosophy, inspired in great part by Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, who died in 1937. Gramsci was imprisoned for many years by Mussolini and did much of his theoretical work in prison. And his work was largely unavailable, even in Italian, until after the Second World War. He was unknown in the English-speaking world until the 1970s, but since then his work has had a profound influence on left theory and on cultural studies. And you don't have to go very far in many directions to run into people who use Gramsci's thinking as a touchstone. Although I can't prove it, I suspect Jim was exposed to Gramsci's writings in the late 1960s and early 1970s when he studied at the Sorbonne. Uh, when I was with Jim, we, went, we took a delegation, and uh, Ken was on it, to Torino in 2005 to see how that city was preparing for the Olympics. Uh, Torino was the home of Antonio Gramsci, so uh, we, we took some time out to meet the mayor of Torino, who was a former steel worker, all of which fit perfectly with Jim's uh, concept of how Gramsci would work. And the mayor of Torino autographed Jim's copy of Gramsci, which was one of the high points for him in that trip. Now, Gramsci believed that working people would achieve social change by rehearsing for their ascent to power through countless smaller initiatives of self-government and creativity. There's much more to it than that, of course, but Jim was inspired as well by Gramsci's idea that while all people have intellect, they're interested in ideas, music, beauty, and art, not all are intellectuals full-time. It's this intellectual capacity, that broadening of an individual's abilities and understanding that can be developed through engagement in social activities and social change, like building housing. He was optimistic that anyone given the chance to think and to take control of their own destiny, even in a limited way, could do well. And that would be good for the individual concern and for society as a whole. This is what I was hoping to try to explore tonight, and we'll see in the, in the videos a bit later if, uh, if his, his aspirations were realized. But I do think that people responded to this fundamental optimism that Jim had about everybody's talent, capacity, and potential power. He summed it up like this in 2006. I have a theory I call the architecture of opportunity. What this means is that you're not just developing a building or redeveloping a project. The project is a tool to get to a larger goal, the creation of enlightened human beings. Through the process, people become highly skilled and knowledgeable and self-contained because they realize they have the ability to affect change in the world around them. Housing was much more than shelter in Jim's mind. It was a process of self-empowerment for those building the community, a process that would continue from the moment the residents moved in. So each project began with careful and exhaustive engagement with those who could form the new community. What were their objectives for the design? How could it be made beautiful? How could it become safe for children or for seniors? The goals and objectives articulated by future residents became the framework for the ultimate design. Jim rejected the idea that affordable housing should be cheap, ugly, or utilitarian. He sought out leading architects and challenged them, people like Ron Ewan and Gregory Enriquez, and the buildings that emerged were both practical and political and reflected community goals. I would like to take Bruce Erickson Place as just one example, which incorporated 38 units intended to replace lost single-room occupancy rooms. And, uh, It'll probably go by here, but you all know it, I'm sure. It's at the corner of Maine and Hastings, just next to the for former Four Corners Community Savings. Um, the building functions as a call to action, not just as a monument to Erickson. The epigram memory, the mother of community on the building's facade, was a reminder to keep Erickson's story alive and also to recall the history of the downtown east side. But it was also a reflection of the vital role Jim ascribed to heritage in retaining collective memories, even in a brand new building. The words that residents picked, and they did pick them, to mark each balcony, dream, respect, vote, elect, courage, are more than a statement. They are both a reflection of Erickson's values and a call to follow in his lead. This building, like all of Jim's project, also incorporated visual arts. Here, a collage by Blake Williams 
highlighting Erickson's life in the downtown east side, which is on the facade. But another artist never far from Jim's creations was Richard Tetro, whose murals were installed in at least two buildings, each a clear reflection of the community that helped produce it. So how did it work out? What has it been like for residents of Jim's developments to experience the architecture of opportunity? And David Ball went out to ask them, and I'd like to watch with you as we hear some, in their own words, uh, how it all panned out. Home is everywhere. When I moved into this building, I was lost again. I needed something to do, so one of the housekeepers in the building here, when she came up with a project to do the pancake breakfast, I jumped right into it. I was talking to Jim one day, and after we had gotten started with the pancakes here, and he says, you know, he says, if you're going to do a job, you're going to do it well or you're not going to do it at all. The prices were going to go up in this area, but it wasn't necessarily Woodward's doing. It was the whole area in general. I mean, they put all these new high rises into effect. The bottom of the, of the ladder just had to start to collapse and it, it, it did. And now there's no housing for the uh, real people who have made this area in the first place. Jim's thing with housing is everybody deserves a good roof over their head. And I have to agree with him because he got a good roof over my head for me. And now all I got to do is keep my nose clean and it'll, it'll remain my home and Jim just fortified that and he's always been uh, kind of in the back of my mind as you know my actual mentor. Yeah, Nito 4 Sisters is a co-op, and it's a self-managed co-op. A lot of the work is done here by the people that live here. But more, it's um, having lived here for as long as I have, you know, I've gotten to know some people here as close friends over the years. When I lived in SROs down here where there was no heat, no light, no running water, you know, in the winter time, people dying in bathtubs. I bounced around down here from hotel to hotel, squandered my money. And, um, and just ended up on the street. And I've gone through continuing struggles since I moved here and uh, you know the 
the members here have pretty much wrapped around me in my struggles and um, not abandoned me. And I can't, um, I can't really express what it means to have a home where you know that you're you're accepted in and you have a place and people care about you. But that's kind of how we are here, and um, that's. That's a lot of what's important in life, I guess. Home is everywhere And it's inside me It's everywhere Home is everywhere I know that this is home, yeah home Thanks again to uh, David Ball of the for putting those interviews together. We struggled to find a way that we could bring the voices of people living in the residences here and have the other discussion as well, and I hope we've succeeded a bit. Perhaps if Jim was here, he would conclude with these words, which uh, are attributed to one of his idols, Antonio Gramsci. He had many others in other fields, but this, I think, was his political one. Uh, Gramsci wrote, I am a partisan. I am alive. I feel the pulse of the activity of the future city. The city that those on my side are building is alive in their conscience. And in it, the social chain does not rest on a few. Nothing of what happens in it is a matter of luck nor the product of fate, but the intelligent work of the citizens. Alive, I am a partisan. That's why I hate the ones that don't take sides, and I hate the indifferent. So uh, a little bit of an insight there into what uh, Jim Green's legacy is around us in the built environment and in the people who are benefiting and, and growing and creating and organizing as a result of his work. I want to thank you for your attention and I'd like to hear from the panel. So Am, that's my part of the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. And thank you very much for uh, being here. Uh, we have uh, four panelists, but one of them is, I just received a text uh, coming a little bit later. Uh, Gary Jobin is uh, up at Heritage Hall and finding his way here because he's had to speak at another uh, event. Um, uh, I just want to introduce the panel uh, uh, with us uh, this evening. Uh, Margot Young is a professor of law at UBC and is involved with the UBC Housing Justice uh, Research Project. She's been uh, collaborating with our office for a number of years, and a number of years ago when Maloon Katari, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Housing, uh, came here, she moderated a discussion with him, and she'll give you a little bit more uh, background in a moment. Uh, right to her left is Celine Mobiles. She's a senior planner, housing policy for the city of Vancouver, and Celine used to work with uh, Jim in the late 90s in the in the provincial uh, government uh, as well. And, uh, and to her uh, left, uh, Michael Shapcott is here with us from Toronto. Uh, he's been active internationally with the Habitat International Coalition and is the co-author with Jack Layton of Homelessness, the Making and Unmaking of a Crisis. Uh, he's been a strong advocate of progressing, progressive housing policies nationally for over 30 years. Anybody who's been working in the development of housing, uh, you, there's no way you would have ever not run into uh, Michael Shapcott. He's been very instrumental in national uh, housing policy, particularly in lobbying the federal government to be uh, back involved. And so I'm just going to maybe pass it on to uh, Margot, uh, first of all, to uh, respond to Jeff's talk and give us a bit more context. Great. Thank you. Do I have is it working okay? Wonderful. Well, let me begin by saying what a pleasure and privilege it is to be part of tonight's panel. This is really... Can you talk a little bit louder, please? I'm sorry. Is, is the microphone working? Yeah, there. I'll hold it a bit closer. How's that? So, to repeat, it's a real pleasure and privilege to be part of tonight's panel. This is, um, I think, a remarkable legacy we celebrate tonight, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the event for including me. We're, we have very few minutes in which to make our initial uh, remarks. So I'm going to limit mine really to three particular points, and I'm happy to elaborate on them in the discussion that follows further. And I want to begin by noting just the importance of the personal. 
to the picture of the housing crisis that we know characterizes our country and is so acutely manifest in the city of Vancouver. This um, presentation you've just seen really reminds us that housing is about people and it's about making sure people have a home and that there's something very distinctive about understanding the importance of the concept of home as opposed to merely shelter or a roof over one's head that it marks out the difference of home from other types of property, that is the social, psychological, and cultural factors that a physical structure acquires through its use as a home. And so when we talk about adequate housing, we're talking about, or we need to be talking about, the intangible and uncommodifiable aspects of housing most importantly, the concept of a home. And too often in cities where housing prices reach sky high levels, we forget that it's really the use value of this property as a home that matters, not the exchange value or the invest uh, investment value. And that um, indeed, what we see in the presentations tonight, in the film tonight, are um, clear indications of the importance of the notions of citizenship. And I come to this topic as a law professor, so I'm going to quote from some courts around the world as is law professors want, but that remind us then of how having access to a home is really an important part of participating and being included in full social and economic citizenship. So the South African Constitutional Court, when L.B. Sachs was a justice on it, he wrote that without minimally adequate housing, lives are spent in systematized insecurity on the fringes of organized society. Leaping across a bit of world geography to the Indian Supreme Court, there they too have noted the importance of housing to full human personhood and that we can come closer to home to the BC Court of Appeal in a recent case out of Victoria where they wrote that the needs of some of our most vulnerable members of our society for one of the most basic human needs, shelter, underlie the struggle towards housing and access to home. And so I think this ties very nicely in the words of legal jurists into the understanding of how housing is about the architecture of opportunity as we heard um, Jim Green spoke. The second point I want to make is that this connection to personhood and to citizenship provides a link to understanding housing in the language of rights. And that when we translate the human need of housing of home into a call for a right to housing, we accomplish seven in, several important things, one of which is to locate those who are in need of housing as full human beings and full citizens, citizens whose dignity comes as a function of their entitlement to have their housing needs met, not simply um, a need that lies contingent upon some other person's charity. That a right to housing is non-negotiable and that it tells convincingly against the state, so it places responsibility and accountability, um, uh, ideally a legally enforceable obligation on the levels of government in that society where the right is stated or where it demands recognition. So there's a way in which translating this need for housing into the language of a right to housing gives us a metric that uh, has uh, cogency and salience in our society to talk about the way in which we need to think about these justice concerns in the shaping of the physical form, the spatial form of our cities. Um, the last point I want to make, and then I'll turn it over to my next pal panelist, is really to segue from this idea of the right to housing, and I'm happy in the questions to talk about a recent legal case located in Ontario where this right is currently being asserted with some difficulty before various Canadian courts. But this reminds us that the accountability that the language of rights brings is an accountability that importantly lodges at all three levels of government. So as we move into the run-up to our next federal election, we need to remind ourselves that attention to housing insecurity across our land is something we should be demanding of our federal politicians and something we should make a strong and visible issue in this next federal election. David Halchansky, who's a housing scholar located in Ontario, and actually who Michael, I think, has co-edited a book with and knows well, tells us that we do have a housing system 
in Canada, but it's an unjust one and it's an exclusionary one. It's one that privileges those with resources, those engaged in home ownership, and one that excludes from access to full and adequate housing those who lie on the margins of our society. And so we must bring to each of our levels of government the, the call for remodeling of existing housing systems of policy and of action and inaction to provide much more considered um, attention to the needs of those who currently don't have access to adequate, adequate housing. Um, and I want to then just jump down to the local level because in fact it's at the municipal level that the policies that exist at the federal and the provincial levels of government and of course at the municipal level of government, but it's in our cities that this policy rubber hits the road of our day-to-day -day existences. And increasingly people are turning to an idea of the local or the civic or the urban context as a place for achievement of progressive politics in a way that hasn't been successful at the provincial or federal levels. And this brings us back um, full-fledged to Jim Green and to his legacy, to the notion of the importance of having leaders on these key social justice issues at the municipal level and the way in which this context, the city, the urban environment in which 80% of us in Canada live is an important site for the sort of progressive political action that will determine the character of justice that we provide access to in our society. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, welcome, uh, Gary, but I won't put you on uh, right away since you just got here. I'll pass it on to uh, Celine. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, um, for coming out tonight. Um, Jim was a, was a dear friend and, and mentor to me, and it's a real privilege to, uh, to be here and to, to share some of my thoughts about, uh, about Jim and, um, and reflect just on the work that I did with him and how um, the values that were embedded in the work he did really reflect my own values and um, what I take forward uh, in the job that I do now at the City of Vancouver as a, as a senior housing planner. And um, I thought, um, uh, you know, as a little aside, as I was preparing and thinking about what I was going to say, I could just hear Jim's voice telling me, Tien, <laughs> uh, Tien, TFU, which kiddo, he would always add a kiddo at the end, which was, try not to F up, kiddo. Those were always his sage words of advice, so hopefully I will, I will do him justice and, um, and, and do well tonight. Um, Jeff asked me to just speak a little bit about the impact of his work um, on not only our city policies, but also um, planning in this neighborhood. And I just want to kind of weave three, three kind of key themes all around, again, to, uh, to, to echo Margot's point, around the importance of safe, secure, and affordable housing. And I think at the heart of that are the people that live in the people that live in those homes, and what it means to them. And I think back to the legacy of Expo, and Olaf Solheim, who uh, which uh, Solheim Place was named after. And even though he lived in a shoddy SRO, um, the eviction and relocation um, uh, led to his death. And I think we have to remember um, that the importance of home and and what can happen when you lose that home. And what's interesting um, in, through this time, and I've been with the city for quite a few years now, is that many of the issues that were relevant uh, during Expo, I think, are still hold true today. We still have uh, a number of crappy single room occupancy hotels in the neighborhood. Um, there are tenants that are still facing eviction, maybe for different reasons, but the impacts are the same. Um, we know that SROs, as crappy as they are, they play a real important role in preventing increases in homelessness. Um, and we know that we have to replace them, and how do we do that? How do we, how do we get that, uh, that new housing built in lack of um, if some of our senior government funding? But I think another important legacy were that, that some of the tools that were created as a result of some of the struggles in the neighborhood. We have a, we have a bylaw, a single room accommodation bylaw that was adopted by the city in 2005 that, that might not entirely protect the stock, but it has slowed the pace of change in the stock. And I think as a city, um, we've also taken much more um, swift action against landlords that um, are, are not doing well by their tenants and maintaining their buildings and, and, and being more um, swift in terms of our prosecution and junctions and trying to work with them to improve conditions in their buildings. Um, I met Jim in the mid-90s, and um, uh, from day one, all he talked about was we need to do something about Woodward's, we need to redevelop that and uh, get some housing into there. 
Um, and uh, that was a big uh, that was a big goal of his. And there were many different attempts at uh, redevelopment of the site, but none of those came to fruition until uh, Jim was elected. And you know, uh, I think the one thing everyone can agree on is that Woodward's uh, act as a catalyst for revitalization of the downtown east side. Um, but what that means um, varies uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, a lot of people are critical of Woodward, saying that it uh, it it you know it it signal to the market that there was a, there was a opportunity here. Um, some people look at the heightened density that was required on the site in order to deliver the, uh, the community benefits, the housing, and whether or not that was uh, uh, appropriate in our historic, uh, historic neighborhood. But there were also obviously a lot of positive impacts, and Gary is here, which is great. He can speak to all the jobs that were created, 200 units of social housing, um, you know, uh, a lot of the educational opportunities that come through the work Am does here at SFU, an atrium that's well used. There was a big basketball game uh, happening when I walked through from my office, which is just over here, um, as part of the project. Um, and I think. Um, Oh, um, that's, I love, that's lovely. <laughs> um, and so, but one of the really important things and something that um, I think has been talked about here tonight and it was so important to Jim and so important in the work that, that I do is engaging uh, what Jim would call rank and file residents um, in a process and the visioning and uh, the um, uh, involving tenants not only in what the future Woodward should be but to the point of um, helping them design uh, the social housing unit was really critical and I think we tried to carry on that theme. There was a downtown east side plan that was uh, adopted last spring where it was developed in partnership uh, with community. Um, always contentious, everything always is, but um, an effort is made to, to involve people whose uh, our decisions will have the most impact on. And the final point I would like to make um, is um, keep your eye on the goal. Jim was very determined and um, he, uh, I think Woodward's is a good example of that. He, uh, he always said, the hell with the critics. Um, I would rather build one unit of social housing than to please a thousand critics. Um, and he was very determined. And um, I think he always, uh, you know, the point was to keep your eye on the goal. What are we doing? We need to build housing and we need to do, we need to do what it, whatever it takes to get there. And um, I think Am um, coined a term <laughs> that I think is appropriate given the discussion about Gramsci. Uh, hegemony was the word that um, Am <laughs> came up with. Um, you're either with Jim or you're not, and if you're not, you better get out of the way. Um, and um, and but Jim also, you know, I think the uh, an important aspect was. The partnerships, right? If he needed to part, he partnered with developers, residents, activists, government, whatever it took in order to to get the housing built. And I think that's so so Im important that um, that we collectively work together and um, and uh, keep pushing for uh, safe, secure, and adequate housing. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Michael right now. Thanks. I brought my fedora because I wanted to channel my inner Jim Green. Um, in fact, I'll wear it. Uh, the the um, I met Jim in the late 1980s. I can't remember exactly when now. My memory on most things is getting very fuzzy these days. But I think that it was it was so, sometimes soon after the Four Sisters opened because I remember he uh, took me on a little tour of the Four Sisters. Um, so you've, you've heard about the Gramscian analysis, you've heard about the housing rights stuff, you've heard about the uh, in, in, real and, and, and meaningful engagement of people. Something that Jim and I used to talk a lot about was something that was actually a little bit more mundane, and that was money. And, and <laughs> money really does grease the wheels, that uh, having good, uh, uh, a, a good uh, debate and uh, a theoretical analysis is really, really important. And uh, of course, uh, uh, community engagement is uh, absolutely critical. But if you don't have money, uh, your housing doesn't uh, really get built very much. And I think the Four Sisters is an interesting example of that because Jim uh, and the others that worked on that project uh, leveraged a federal housing program. That was in the good old days when we actually had a national housing program. In 1987, the year that the Four Sisters opened was actually a high watermark uh, in that program. 
Uh, that year, there were 127 co-ops that were funded across the country, including the Four Sisters, 4,560 co-op units. But also, uh, on the other part of the uh, National Housing Program, the nonprofit uh, side of things, there were 16,239 nonprofit units, seniors units, community-based nonprofit, municipal nonprofit. That year, 1987, there were 20,799 uh, affordable homes that were uh, created, social housing homes that were created across the country. And that was a bit of a high watermark for our national housing program, which started in 73 and then was shut down in uh, 93. If we had maintained uh, production uh, funding uh, at that level of say 20,000 units a year since then we'd have an additional 600,000 homes that we don't actually have now uh, that would be about a total of 1.2 million social housing homes across the country it wouldn't mean that homelessness would be eradicated uh, in Canada but it would sure be a lot different than the uh, homeless crisis that you're experiencing here in Vancouver that uh, we're experiencing in my home city of Toronto and that we're seeing in every other part of the country. So money really does matter and the federal government, uh, its involvement uh, really does uh, matter as well. And Jim understood that and understood that in order to act locally, you've got to engage the uh, national government. Now, since um, uh, 1993, the federal government stopped funding uh, uh, basically all uh, co-op housing, so no new federal funding for co-ops after 93, and uh, radically cut the funding for nonprofit housing. In 96, the federal government announced its withdrawal from a number of social housing programs, uh, and then uh, in 1998 amended the National Housing Act uh, in order to radically change the mission of Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation from being an agency dealing with affordable housing issues to being a mortgage insurance uh, agency, of which has been uh, a big commercial success. Um, and the impact of that uh, over the years has been very, very dramatic. So instead of having those 600,000 new homes that we should have had, had we just simply maintained things at the 1987 level, what we have is a steadily shrinking supply of social housing. And those of you that live in uh, co-op and nonprofit, federally subsidized co-op and nonprofit housing know exactly what I'm talking about. In 2010, for instance, we had uh, across the country 613,500 uh, federally subsidized homes. Uh, by uh, 2018, the federal government uh, projects there'll be 452,300, which means we're going to lose in that eight-year period, which we're sort of halfway through now, 161,200 uh, social housing homes are 26% of our national stock. And you might say, well, that's wonderful. We must have turned the corner on the housing crisis. We no longer need the housing because we're cutting out all the uh, uh, existing housing. We're not building any new housing. And of course, the answer is that uh, that's not the case. This is the uh, austerity agenda uh, writ large in terms of, uh, in terms of housing. So the... the um, Federal government uh, and sometimes the provincial governments do make funding announcements. Jim was very much part of some of the national struggles we had in the year 2000, for instance, when we convinced the uh, federal government to commit, first of all, 680 million, and then it rose to a billion dollars over an eight-year period for uh, new social and affordable housing. In uh, the uh, tw 2005 federal budget, uh, the latent amendment to the federal budget uh, brought in $1.4 billion over two years for affordable housing. And then in 2009, uh, the federal stimulus budget, $2 billion for social housing uh, over a two-year period. So we've had some successes, and Jim uh, was a part of uh, a number of those campaigns uh, that were successful, but they didn't actually succeed in doing um, uh, doing uh, what we really needed to do, which was to create a permanent, long-term, financially robust national housing program. What they succeeded in doing was injecting over the short term uh, a few billion dollars, and I'm sorry to say a few billion as if it doesn't count for much because a billion dollars is actually a lot of money, and you can do good things with a billion. But set in the scale of the national housing crisis across Canada, a billion dollars sadly doesn't get you very far, especially when it's uh, short-term funding. And most recently, of course, in 2013, the federal government, with great fanfare and numerous press releases, announced an extension of the National Affordable Housing Program and the National Homelessness Program, but it was in the context of um, uh, actual cuts to uh, both of those programs. So they actually announced a five-year extension, but it's less money. So I think that uh, uh, coming back to uh, 
the kind of conversations I used to have with Jim. We used to strategize about how we can actually get some real financial resources so communities can actually build the kind of housing that they need, like the uh, housing you saw here that's part of Jim's legacy, or some of the housing that I helped to build in Toronto, or uh, other advocates have built in other uh, parts of the country. And that's the key struggle that we're engaged in uh, right now. And I think that that would be uh, one of the things that Jim would be saying to us tonight is that we really have to focus uh, uh, yes, on uh, making sure that uh, we understand uh, a rights-based approach to housing and situate our, our work there. And yes, we have to understand the vital need for community-led and uh, community-based housing, uh, but we also need to make sure we've got the financial resources so that those dreams can turn into uh, a reality and the aspirations are not just simply aspirations, but they become real. So uh, I, I, I think that um, Jim would really uh, enjoy the uh, debate we're going to be having in the lead up to the federal election, which may happen in the spring, may happen in the fall. Uh, but he would really want us to focus uh, the uh, discussion not on a high level um, uh, uh, discussion about things, but how much money uh, are each of the political parties prepared to commit uh, to a national housing program and what, what's that going to mean for Vancouver, for Toronto, and for other cities across the country. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Gary Jobin uh, here, who's lived at Four Sisters Housing Co-op and the Lori Krill Housing Co-op, but for the past uh, 20 years has worked uh, with uh, Blade Runners, a construction training program that Jim was instrumental in establishing uh, just next door to us related to uh, GM Place. And uh, Blade Runners are currently working on a housing project over at the, the Remand Center. I'm going to pass it over to Gary. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Sam. Uh, first of all, I apologize for being late. I was at another event with a Blade Runner who's now a second year carpenter apprentice, so we're celebrating that tonight. He works on the Trump Towers. Uh, yes, Blade Runner's place uh, is being built at 250 Powell Street. Uh, Jim wanted to uh, you know, have housing for youth. He tried many years ago and used the acronym Hip Hop, Housing is Priority and Honing Our Potential, getting youth to build housing and move into it, but for some reason or not, it didn't work out. So. We were able to get those units, and that's how the Bruce Erickson came. So, I mean, I'm just, my asthma is bugging me, so I apologize. But uh, we got kids working at right now at 250. Powell have 37 units of housing, uh, four one bedrooms, 33 bachelors, a gymnasium, a sweat, and uh, it's going really, really well. Uh, occupancy we're looking is going to be June the 1st. Uh, it's in partnership with the Bloom Group, the city, and the province. And that's when Jim always talked about is when we work in an inclusive manner, we can have these types of successes. And this is another project. And one thing we all learned from Jim is you learned how to be persistent. He never, ever gave up on an idea. It's ironic, you know, it's taken 22 years and we run our 21st year of Blade Runners when a lot of people didn't think it would last 20 minutes. It's a model that's been adapted across, you know, Canada. We've worked with agencies in Calgary, Toronto, uh, New Orleans. I was in Washington presenting at the OECD at uh, Capitol Hill in November and we're really well received there and they wanted to know how can we take this model around the world, Gary? Would, would you want to come to Paris? and talk about it. So we said, shit, oh, so I said, we said, yeah, we'd go to, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll go to Paris and uh, talk about it. But it's the, kids, <laughs> it's, 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 it's the kids themselves working with developers. So we got great support from developers. And the developer here that uh, developed uh, Woodward's Ian Gillespie and West Bank are so good to us. Still hiring our kids. One of our great success stories is a kid that's working at, uh, at uh, Telus Gardens. He came into Blade Runners last year. He did seven years in Folsom Prison. He was involved with gangs in Compton, California, but had some native blood. And uh, was born in BC, but raised in Compton by his grandmother. And he came into Blade Runners, and I placed him at the Lorne in, West, uh, in the West End on one of Ian's projects. And he says, Gary, this guy keeps coming around in really nice cars and stuff like that and uh, every Saturday. And he said, I'm pretty nervous to approach a guy. I said, his name's Ian approach him, tell him you're a Blade Runner. So anyways, he does it, and then Monday I get an email from me and just saying, Gary, could you, could you give me a call? I want to talk about this, this Malcolm kid. I said, oh shit, what did he say? <laughs> right, and I said, listen, so I went to see him, and I, he said, no, he's really nice, and now, you know, I was pointing things out, Gary, I hope I didn't, you know, he said, I hope I didn't have up. I said, I don't know, but I, I got to give him a call. So I said, I set up a call with him. He said, Gary, this kid's got potential. He said, uh, I want to pay his way through school. 
he said, we're gonna, I'm going to leave him in charge of all the deficiencies on this project, and then I'm going to move him to Telus Gardens. And now he's an assistant site foreman at Telus Gardens. He's only been in construction one year. So these are the type of success, like I said, we can have. We, it's a short-term program. Jim wasn't in the long-term uh, em employment programs and training. It was more short-term. Uh, ours is three weeks, a hot breakfast and lunch, some training, get the kids a job, then have job coaches come in and work with the kids outside the workplace, because that's where the issues are with some of the kids. They're good kids, but a lot of them just didn't grow up with the right support systems, having them, you know, good education. A lot of them were involved with crime. Uh, drugs, stuff like that, and, uh, but uh, it's, it's like I said, we have an 80% success rate of kids that go to a construction site two years later working in the construction trades. Uh, we had 18 kids working on this building itself. This is where we met West Bank, and uh, 17 of those kids are still involved in the trades. One's a foreman with Hall Construction, so like I said, these are the types of successes we can have. He believed in it. He fought like hell. I know he's happy. You know, he's proud of Blade Runner. He's always, we'd always touch base every Friday, and uh, we miss him. But his housing is going to be ready for June the 1st, and we're awful proud of that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Gary. You know, one of the things that a number of you mentioned was that as federal and provincial levels of go government have gotten away from their uh, levels of historical funding, cities have been challenged in that uh, citizens are calling for more affordability and, and, and their hands are really tied in terms of what kind of funding is available. And, uh, you know, you can bring in density, you can do projects like uh, Woodward's, but once again, those can be very polarizing things when the senior levels of government aren't there to invest at the level uh, that's needed to have those types of um, uh, projects uh, that were built in the 80s uh, and the, in the 90s. I'm just going to quote here from uh, Maloon Katari, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Housing. When he visited in 2007, uh, this was his quote about Vancouver. He said, there is a deep homelessness problem here. I must say I was taken aback by the scale of the crisis here in the downtown east side. It's glaringly apparent in Vancouver that for quite some time, successive governments have failed to create the housing that is necessary. You have a legacy of misguided government policy that has led to this massive development crisis in housing and homelessness. Uh, about five years later, when he came, he was interviewed by the Georgia Strait, and he said, unless you have a situation where there's more rent control and you have a situation where more middle-income people are able to afford to live in Vancouver and you have more serious attempts to have mixed neighborhoods and regulate speculation, until you see all of that, there isn't going to be much of a change. And I think the challenge that we find ourselves in is, is precisely maybe, uh, in a way, uh, a problem that Jeff, you as a city councillor, Selena, somebody regulating at the city, uh, can maybe speak to, and maybe in a broader way, uh, Margo and, and Michael, if you could also speak to that in terms of, you know, what kind of policies from other places could Vancouver um, uh, be looking to, uh, given the, the 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 public context. Right now, there is. Uh, a number of nonprofits in uh, Ontario pushing uh, for a national housing policy in the lead up to the federal election, the uh, Cities for People campaign, those types of things. But uh, I'm wondering if you can you can speak to that. Well, it's a uh, it's an issue that we deal with every day at the city, and and Celine can certainly add her perspective. But recently, in the last couple of weeks, the issue on Woodlands, where a, a three or four story apartment has been bought by a landlord who's uh, upgrading it dramatically. The result is that it's not safe to live in it during the reconstruction. And at the end of it, it'll still be rental, but it won't be affordable to the people who are currently there. Each of the dimensions of the housing crisis, in my view, is insoluble at the city level. And that's something that uh, uh, we can work on, as someone challenged me today in an email, we can be creative about, but being creative doesn't solve the problem that Michael pointed to, which is the fundamental lack of a supportive policy framework with real money. And I, I think we have to have that conversation in a much more blunt way, that uh, you know, most of the municipalities in the Lower Mainland don't have any problem with the current housing situation. No one ever challenges them on it, and uh, they don't do anything about it. Here in Vancouver, we make an effort. Uh, I don't think it's a sufficient effort, but I don't believe that we can make a sufficient effort as a city government on our own. And I think that's the larger conversation that we have to have and why it's relevant to raise it at the federal level. I mean, this is the big difference. If you're like, what's new today from when Jim was there, Michael put his finger on it, the total absence of those federal and provincial programs to me is the single largest factor that stops us from building on Jim's legacy. I don't know what others want to add to that, but. 
Um, I'd just like to add, uh, maybe just uh, talking about single room occupancy hotels in this neighborhood, uh, we have a bylaw that manages the rate of change. Uh, so if you want to convert or demolish a unit, you have to come to council and get a permit, and council can, uh, can attach a number of conditions to that permit. But rent increases aren't considered a form of conversion. And it's been a huge debate, I think, from day one since the bylaw was enacted about why isn't that the case. And, and I think for us, I mean, you know, rent controls, that's something that is governed by the provincial government. But one of the things that's challenging is you have this deteriorating stock. Um, uh, some landlords are just choosing not to rent to folks on welfare and are getting much higher rents. But for folks on welfare, 375 a month is not going to cover your basic operating cost of running a hotel like that that's in need of repair, um, uh, insurance, all the different costs of doing that. So um, it's also not just about rent control, but increasing incomes. And I think employment, um, increasing the welfare rate, um, all of those things are equally important. Um, because I think um, an investment in the existing rental stock is, is also very important. There's an organization based out of uh, Barcelona called the United Cities and Local Governments. It's the uh, international NGO for uh, local governments, and they have a wonderful database which actually shows some amazing things that are being done by cities uh, around the world uh, in terms of tackling various dimensions of the housing crisis and homelessness, and some amazing, inventive, inspiring ideas. Uh, I was at the World Urban Forum uh, last year in Medellin in Colombia, and uh, it was just, uh, just astonishing uh, and inspiring to hear all, the, all these things. Uh, I'm particularly a big fan of uh, housing trust funds, uh, which is um, uh, a financing vehicle. It's, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just putting a pile of money together into a uh, fund uh, and then uh, doling the money out for uh, housing projects. In the United States, uh, housing trust funds have taken off in a big way. There are uh, more than 700 housing trust funds at either the municipal or state level. Uh, since the 1970s, they've allocated more than a billion dollars. Very, very inspiring stuff. However, <laughs> there's a big however. Uh, the, uh, all of this amazing activity has not uh, 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 even come close to matching the amount of money that's been lost because the US federal government has been withdrawing from housing. So yes, there are amazing things that can be done at the municipal level. Vancouver, you've got a lot of good practices here that uh, those of us in other parts of Canada look at and say, that's, that's, that's cool, we wanna do that kind of stuff. Similarly, there's things in St. John's, Newfoundland that um, um, Stella Burry Housing Project, for instance, uh, working with uh, women leaving the prison system, it's a model for everybody in the country, it's a brilliant project. But again, we go back to this issue of uh, how do we finance uh, this sort of stuff and how do we deal with the reality in the last 20 to 30 years that uh, neoliberal economic policies uh, uh, have uh, resulted in, in a notion that uh, small governments, lo low taxes, and everyone for themselves is the predominant economic and social philosophy. So we have to challenge that. I don't think it's inevitable that um, uh, because we've com come through now so far 20, 30 years of this kind of government, that that's the kind of government we're going to have for the rest of uh, human civilization. Uh, I actually think that uh, Jim would tell us that if you don't like the kind of government that we're getting federally, then go out there and do something about it. Uh, start to agitate uh, and uh, uh, insist on this. I want to tell one quick story from 1993 when the federal government, um, uh, it was in the dying days of the Mulroney government, and they they put the ax to funding for, uh, the, uh, for new social and co-op housing under the previous uh, social housing program, and then there was an election, and the Liberals uh, under Jean Chrétien were voted in with the Red Book promise to put money into housing, which they didn't do. Uh, and when I talked to some politicians in 94, they said it was one of the easiest decisions I ever made because nobody ever, nobody actually protested except for a few housing advocates and they expected them to protest. Most people didn't. Uh, I think we actually have to uh, uh, start to uh, say that we don't accept uh, politics as usual. We don't accept this notion uh, that low taxes and small governments and, and a federal government uh, that is sort of uh, uh, only focused on fighting wars in uh, uh, somewhere or another and uh, not on uh, uh, supporting building housing here in Vancouver, that that's not the kind of federal government we want. So uh, I'm not going to say anything partisan uh, because <laughs> I actually work for a charitable foundation. I'm not allowed to be partisan uh, because of our current federal government. Um, <laughs> but, but I will tell you, 
but I will tell you that if, if you know, one of the things Jim would, would, would absolutely say to us is if you don't like the way that the direction the federal government is taking, then Dan will go out and do something about it. And that's what we're all uh, attempting to do. And I think the federal election is a good opportunity, but it's not the only opportunity. And there are lots of opportunities between elections for, for people to, uh, to talk about things. And maybe one last thing I'll say about this, because Maloon has been mentioned, uh, Maloon Qatari, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing. You should know, if you don't already know this, it's a, perhaps too much of a secret, the current UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Adequate Housing is Leilani Farha, who is a Canadian. And uh, Leilani is a brilliant, brilliant uh, housing uh, uh, activist, advocate, um, and uh, one of the great things when uh, she was running her non-campaign to be the Special Rapporteur, because becoming Special Rapporteur is like being Pope. You're not supposed to actually want the job, and if you campaign too openly for it, then people think it's distasteful. <laughs> So those of us around Leilani were actually lobbying on her behalf, and I was phoning a lot of governments around the world, uh, ambassadors, asking them to vote for Leilani. And uh, I often heard them say, um, you know, the Canadian government is actually opposed to a Canadian being the next special rapporteur. And I said, no, I know, isn't that great? <laughs> and that must tell you how really good Leilani is. Anyway, uh, Leilani is uh, helping uh, a, a number of us as we lead to a major UN conference in 2015. This was the point I was trying to get to. Um, uh, the, uh, it's the Habitat 3 conference. Habitat 1 was here in Vancouver in 86. It was the first UN conference on housing and human settlements. It was a very powerful moment uh, on the international stage because the right to housing, uh, which has been recognized in a number of documents, began to take some really substantial shape out of the Vancouver Declaration in 1986. Uh, and then 10 years later with Habitat 2 in Istanbul, uh, the Habitat agenda began to emerge uh, in uh, uh, some uh, interesting uh, dimensions. And now we're going into the final stages of uh, Habitat uh, 3. And I think it's, it's a chance at the international level to uh, begin to express some of these issues, but also to hold our own Canadian government accountable because compared to many governments around the world, uh, our national government is a laggard when it comes to housing funding, housing programs. So great set of comments, and I, I will add to it just a couple of other observations. Um, and one is that I think we need as a city in Vancouver to think about the neoliberal growth politics that have animated our march towards becoming a global city. And that this idea of how we construct our urban environment, um, the way in which Vancouver's become a hedge city, is a safe place to park your money, to make lots of money out of residential property that's not being used for residential purposes so when this happens, is an important piece of the dialogue we need to have and the way in which we understand what cities are about that needs to change. There's a wonderful quote by an urban theorist, Sharon Zukin, who talks about the way in which our modern neo liberal cities induce us through pacification by cappuccino. And that it's really, it reminds me of that phrase from Wordsworth, getting and spending we lay waste our powers. So we live in this neoliberal world and we're forgetting actually the uh, more authentic and just forms of social interaction, spatial construction around the notions of social justice that ought to inform the shared urban community we construct and have. And so there is an important piece of how we as citizens in Vancouver need to think about what's happening to our neighbors, uh, to our neighborhood, caring about our neighbors, and reconceiving what it means to come together in this form of urban, urban shared existence. But I do also want to speak to the fact that the federal and provincial governments are so important as pieces of this picture. People talk commonly about housing being a problem of an affordability gap, which reflects a relationship between supply and demand in the housing market. And I would argue, um, and that would be another comment that I won't go into in depth now, that we need to think of housing as not a good to be traded on the market, but as rather a social need to be delivered as a form of entitlement. But to go back to this idea of the affordability gap, both levels of government, senior levels of government, the provincial and federal government, have roles in dealing with the fact that incomes can't 
meet the price of housing. And you can do that through increasing the supply of affordable housing, but you can also do that in terms of increasing incomes for those who have low and moderate incomes. So there's a role clearly for the provincial government in terms of welfare assistance rates and shelter assistance. So there's a role for the federal government in terms of rent supplements and ways in which it can actually influence the kind of income that individuals have available. But there's also a piece that's about the supply of housing. And again, the federal resources and provincial resources become very important. But this isn't to say that there aren't distinctive things that the city can and ought to do. And Vancouver is doing some of these. It can probably do more. And there are examples from around the world of creative responses. This is not to deny that cities have the most limited jurisdiction and smallest resources of all levels of government in Canada. So I think it's really fair to say they can't do it on their own. But it's also important not to get it caught up in this shell game of Canadian federalism that so many levels of government consistency consistently play. So whenever you go to a provincial politician and name a problem, they say, well, that's actually federal jurisdiction. The federal government currently says, well, then really that's not on our jurisdictional plate. Look to your provincial government. And so we need to resist the idea of constantly defaulting onto other levels of government and while acknowledging that for cities in particular, there are pretty significant constraints in terms of resources and jurisdiction, and the need for cities to have effective partnerships with these senior levels of government, there still are things that cities can do, and, and you know that our civic government, I think, is engaged in conversations about to some extent anyway. Thank you very much, Amado. <clears throat> A lot of uh, tonight was just trying to get a conversation uh, kick-started in May. We're going to be doing uh, a day at the Center for Dialogue with Women Transforming Cities. And in the fall, we're going to be kick-starting a housing policy series, which uh, basically on a monthly basis will be continuing this discussion with uh, many other voices uh, at the table. Uh, right now, Bug House 5 is getting warmed up uh, over in the other room, so we're going to take our conversation over there, even though it's just getting started. But I wanted to give the last word to uh, Jeff Meggs, who uh, kick-started the evening. Well, thanks, Adam, and I really would like to thank uh, all of you for coming, but also the panelists who uh, you know, gave a very, very interesting, to me, cross-section of, of really important responses, and I'll try to try to summarize them uh, quickly, uh, but preface it with this comment. I think that Anne made the statement when we were planning this, and I, I, th I feel it's true, this is not to uh, whine, but I think the housing debate is very polarized to the city of Vancouver and in the region, and that's leading to lack of understanding. We, we are all good at shouting and, and also at tuning out, and I think we've got to find a place, and I hope that this dialogue is a starting point for that, to really sit down and uh, make it possible for all of us who care about this issue very much to put all of the cards on the table and start to sort out a stronger way forward. You know, Michael talked a bit about money and, and land trusts and, and some of the things that could be done in the inspiring models that are out there. They are there, and uh, we're, we're, we're working on some of those things. I see some people in the room have been involved in that. They could be a powerful tool, and unlike some of the other things I've said are hard to do here, they, they can be done and, and mobilized by the city. I think they would be mobilized faster if there was wider understanding and support for them. Uh, they don't necessarily involve density, which gets me to the, uh, to the second question, which is, is the, the need for a community understanding of what it will take to produce housing, which is, in my view, going to be larger building forms. I'm not saying high-rise towers in every case at all. But I think that some density and volume is going to be necessary. You know, supply in and of itself doesn't solve the affordability crisis. It's an obvious thing to say, but we've had record construction of condominiums for the last two or three years, and we're in the worst situation we've ever been in. So we really need to be transparent and clear with the public about that, that it's going to take support for initiatives at city and provincial and federal level. I thought Gary uh, really made an interesting comment about the need to mobilize not just partnerships, but the full value of all housing projects. And there was a lot more we could do certainly here in the rest of the region to say, you know, we want you to start not just uh, making your building greener or uh, ensuring that there's community gardens there, but making it a training ground for people who need skills and opportunities to learn. And uh, those requirements don't impose costs on anyone. They just imp impose benefits on all of us. And, and I think that that's a really important lesson. Um, Celine pointed to some of the really important policy contradictions that we face all the time. I referenced one of them, where on the one hand, we want people to keep their properties in good conditions so tenants are not subjected to uh, subhuman conditions. On the other hand, those renovations cost money and at some point have to be paid off. 
And that, that conversation needs to occur in a more thoughtful way as well, because the city has certain tools in that regard, but uh, lacks some of the hammers that would really be helpful. And as, as Celine said, we have you know, taken lawsuits against slumlords, some of whom don't mind being quoted by people like David Ball as a slumlord. They'll say, yes, I am a slumlord. So, you know, there's a, they don't see a defamation problem in that. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so that's the kind of hard nuts we're up against. But for the most part, uh, it is possible to do something uh, you know, across the rental stock. So I really appreciate this. this. I think that, um, you know, thinking of Jim's legacy is very important because we need to draw clear-headed distinctions between the situation that he was working with and the ones that we face, but I think that we can take a lot of lessons too from the fact that he mobilized a whole lot of people in partnership and people who had never thought they would be able to create and build housing and homes and prove to them they could do it, and that's been to all of our benefits. So we all look forward to having the conversation continue in the next room, right? Yep. And um, there's uh, Jim will be there. Uh, you can have your picture taken with him. <laughs> and uh, and uh, thanks again very much to everyone for coming, and we'll see you all again next year, I hope.